Mixed martial arts is, of course, a solo sport, but unless you're Tony Ferguson or Yuri Pahaska, you're probably not going to do your training on your own. You need people to learn from and partners to work with, and usually the bonds formed by fighters and coaches can be as close as family. But of course, as Obi-Wan found out against Anakin, even your brother can turn against you. And guys, the rivalries we've seen from fighters who used to train together or were friends have been some of the most intense in the history of the sport. Teammates going head to head, friends who've trained together for years or even those who are once as close as brothers have all fought each other in MMA and the stories of what happened next, well, some of them are unbelievable. It me, Balian from MMA On Point. Big shout out to all you Hall of Famers out there, you the real MVPs. And these are 10 friends who turned rivals. Number 10, Shinya Aoki and Satoru Kitaoka. So imagine finding out that you're going to be fighting a guy who's not just a friend, not just a training partner of 10 years, but a guy you've even opened a gym with. Japanese fighters Aoki and Kitaoka had first studied together under another Japanese legend, Yuki Nakai. You might recognize his name as he was famously blinded by Gerard Gordeaux. Yuki, though, went on to be one of the most influential trainers in Japanese MMA and would also train both Shinya and Satoru, even promoting both guys to the rank of black belt. Their relationship went one step further though. The two of them, along with Masakasu Imanari, don't need to tell you what he's famous for, all founded the Nippon Top Team in 2008, which became a powerhouse for Japanese grappling. In fact, in one of Shinya's most famous moments, when he broke Hirota's arm, he'd done that as an act of revenge for his good mate Satoru. But exactly two years after that fabled night at the 2011 New Year's show, Dream wanted Shinya Aoki to defend his title against his good bud Kitaoka. Not enemies, but these two were definitely rivals. I mean, they'd been rivals in the training room for the last 10 years, I'm sure. Considering that, something people didn't expect was for things to get pretty intense come fight time. Kitaoka said yesterday, Aoki will not leave the ring unscathed. And Dream knew what they were doing. They poured on the emotion with the fight promo as well. But despite all that, Kitaoka still made the walk looking super focused. He could make a stripper nervous with that look. And it seemed like for this fight, they'd completely put their friendship aside. Satoru was acting kind of crazy. Well, I guess crazier than normal. Aoki nearly tapped him multiple times. And the fact that they'd been training partners meant absolutely nothing. When you look at the absolute viciousness of this fight, the amount of blood that is involved, the attrition both men go through. There's anything but friendship on display inside that ring. Number nine, Kamaru Usman and Gilbert Burns. You can never be sure when training at a big MMA team that looking around the room, you aren't going to fight one of those guys, even if they've been there for your entire UFC journey. And that's something Gilbert Burns got to watch after a young Kamaru Usman joined his team. They shared the mats at the Black Zillions gym back in 2012 and then ended up both moving to Florida in 2017 and started training together at Samford MMA. But their relationship goes way beyond that. Look back through both careers and you'll see them helping out each other quite a lot. You might remember Usman was on the Ultimate Fighter. Well, my guy Gilbert was in there even celebrating with him. And of course, Usman returned the favor, jumping in Burns' corner when he fought Michel Prezeres. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure things were made a bit easier when Usman ultimately left the team to relocate with Trevor Whitman. And when the fight seemed inevitable, they started getting asked about it. But according to Gil, they were apparently never friend friends, more like work colleagues. And Usman is one of those guys who says he doesn't see a face, just a body. But then he also did start to stir the pot a little. We both know. Last year and a half, he's really done some some good work, and uh, and I see that, and I I recognize that, and I commend him for that. But we both know. They might not have shown it beforehand, but there was a lot of emotion going into this fight. Remember their mutual coach, Henry Hoof, refused to corner Burns and be a part of it at all. All of the emotion came out in the fight, though, with Burns just wildly attacking Kamaru early. But the champ just looked spectacular. He ended up using the new tools he'd learned from his new gym and knocked out Gilbert. Can't have been easy for either guy to get in there. And this one all ended in tears. Number eight, Sakuraba versus Tamura. What about two guys who trained together and just hated each other? And when down the line they were booked to fight, it turned into a fucking war. Both Sakuraba and Tamura cut their teeth like a lot of early Japanese MMA stars in UWFI. It was a Japanese pro wrestling organization. But Tamura also used this as a chance to make Sakuraba do all the menial chores around the dojo. The stories go that he used to bully him relentlessly and just beat him up around the gym. And apparently Saku had wanted to knock him out badly. MMA and pro 
Pride became the next big thing and the execs were desperate to make the two legends fight each other, but it just wasn't happening. It wasn't like Sakuraba wasn't trying. He called out Tamura, but got no response and ended up fighting Minowa Man. He called him a real pro wrestler. Yeah, whatever that means. Those Pride execs didn't give up though. Right up till their last show, they were trying to make this fight happen. They got them to verbally agree in the ring together. But guess what? Pride was purchased by the UFC and the fight didn't happen. Thankfully though, Japanese MMA now had Dream instead, who did what Pride could not. And after almost 20 years of animosity, these two legends were fighting. Fighting. Oi. Fighting. Fucking fighting. Fighting. Fucking. Fighting! Saki had said he was surprised the guy finally agreed to fight him, and he even wanted to do it bare knuckle, saying he wasn't afraid to get covered in blood and it would just make it more exciting. To call this a grudge match is an understatement. There is genuine bad blood between these two men. This one has been a long time in the making. The fight played out though with Tamura mostly on top. But right at the end of the first round, Sakuraba nearly armbarred him and it was just a great fight to watch. Tamura again controlled for basically all of the second round until about one minute left where Saku took him down and, and tried to end him, but it was all too little too late. And it was the senior man who walked away with the W in the fight and kind of the W in the rivalry as well. Number seven, Francis Ngannou versus Cyril Garn. Under the direction of Fernand Lopez at the MMA factory in Paris, both Francis Ngannou and Cyril Garn would cross paths on their way to UFC titles. But we didn't really know anything about how close they'd been or what the training had been like. We knew Ngannou's relationship with head coach Fernand Lopez had already fallen apart. He told media that Ngannou was developing an ego problem and not listening to him in training anymore. I think there was probably more to it than that. But Francis had already left Paris and gone to Eric Nixick and Extreme Couture when the Garn fight was booked. Now, these are two guys that don't really talk that much anyway. I mean, English isn't their first language, but the press conference kind of revealed how deep their rivalry went. Francis did say this week that he knocked you out in sparring, and then you went and said that didn't happen. So what? who's telling the truth? You, you went to the floor, Cyril. Well, can you explain exactly what's, what's happening? Oh, you don't remember? Well, left, left high kick. Left high kick, and you yeah. say I'm not, you knocked me down? You went on the floor or not? He, he, was, he was knocked out, probably. Cold from Nganu right there, but I think Garn hadn't really enjoyed training with Francis in the first place. And it's a beautiful left kick. And the problem with Francis is just, he don't like to, to spar, technical sparring. You like to make power, and I told you a little bit a few times before. As far with 155er, as far with girls, and they don't complain. Now that is a pretty bold statement from Francis right there. And he refused to acknowledge they were even teammates, probably because he was about to go and try and punch his lights out. And you know, Garn seemed genuinely upset that Francis had been disrespectful and wouldn't acknowledge their past. It ended up going all five rounds in a competitive fight where honestly though at times, it did look more like a training session than an actual fight. Number six, Anderson Silva versus Vitor Belfort. You might have been there for the reign of Anderson Silva. Even looking back now, you'll know he's one of the most dominant champions and he didn't always have a lot of animosity towards his opponents. It was all about respect, apart from when he took on guys like Chel Sonnen, who, you know. He don't expect nothing. Someone you think he would have a ton of respect for, though, is his fellow Brazilian legend, Vitor Belfort. The guy had had his ups and downs in the UFC, but made a comeback and was on a crash course with Anderson. So the UFC booked a title fight between the two Brazilian icons, and over 20 members of the Brazilian media made the trip to Vegas to report on what they called the fight of the century. Anderson, though, told these media if he got the chance, he was going to hurt Vitor badly. But why? Well, Belfort used to travel around gyms in Brazil to get work in, so he and Anderson had trained together many times at different gyms. But their relationship gets even more personal. At a dark time when Vitor Belfort's career was on the rocks, his sister had just been kidnapped, and he moved from the city of Rio to Belo Horizonte. Anderson, who was also living in Rio, apparently drops everything to spend time with Vitor and help him get through it. They had only really fallen out because Vitor had accepted the fight with Anderson in the first place, something Silva just couldn't believe given their history. During media week, Belfort had called Anderson two-faced and said that he wears a mask. So Anderson rocked up to the weigh-ins in a mask and it nearly started a brawl. There 
was lots of bad blood for this one, but when it came to the actual fight, it was over in just three minutes, and it could not have been more iconic. A front kick to the face, the first in UFC history. And Silva made things pretty clear where he stood with his post-fight statement, saying, when people train together, you don't leave and come back to fight your former teammates. Vitor broke that code of honor, and he paid for it tonight. Number five, TJ Dillashaw and Cody Garbrandt. Everything was great at Team Alpha Male up until 2012, when a new coach arrived at the gym, Dwayne Ludwig, who took over the strike in training, forming a close relationship with TJ Dillashaw. Meanwhile, Cody Garbrandt has just scored three knockouts on the regional scene, so he packs up from Ohio to move to California to join this great gym he's heard about. Now, this is where these two future champs met and trained together, but TJ apparently was also a notoriously bad training partner. TJ was probably one of the worst training partners of all time. You know, he would spar with the kids that are just there to have fun and, and learn, us, and he would beat the living shit out of them, like, till they're crying on the mat. And obviously, injuring your teammates is not going to make anyone feel better about the situation. Me and you, while we're boxing, he's throwing elbows while we're doing jiu-jitsu. I shot in on TJ, and, you know, I was on all fours. He was sprawled out, and he need me on top. Of the head. At least from the outside, it also seems like Dwayne was kind of driving a wedge between everyone and TJ. Dwayne was an incredibly good coach, but also an incredibly bad coach. He was bad, he just wasn't a leader, but he just alienated a few people, you know, he was, TJ was his pet. And then, of course, we all saw it spill out on an episode of The Ultimate Fighter when Conor McGregor brought up TJ Dillashaw's disloyalty. Right, thinks Dwayne's a snake, though. What do you think of that? Different opinions, you know. Just two months later after this, and TJ officially just left Team Alpha Male. I think that we filter out, you know, egos and bad vibes. And obviously, Dwayne and TJ aren't there, and they're together, so team two peas in a pod. Eventually, a fight between the two of them made sense in the UFC, and there was loads of animosity, tons of storylines and emotions going into it. Because he's trying to play the victim. I mean, he's going in there and saying Danny Castillo and Justin Buckles are his best friends, but where are they? They're on my team. Well, how about when you went home you crying? Back the fuck down. How about when you went home I crying never and left cried. back, dude? Ultimately, it was TJ who came out on top and knocked out Cody. Now, the rivalry was far from done there, though, and they ran it straight back away with pretty much the same result. It seemed like TJ got the last laugh, but then just a few months later, you know, he tested positive for EPO. Number four, John Jones versus Rashad Evans. When Rashad Evans went on season two of The Ultimate Fighter in 2005, his only MMA coach had been Dan Seven, and only after winning the show did he join a bigger team, Greg Jackson's MMA Academy, and he was very happy about it, but someone was coming along to spoil the party. In August 2009, Greg specifically asks Rashad Evans if he would allow the talented new UFC fighter John Jones to join the team after repeating the mantra that they would never fight each other. They became as close as brothers, with Rashad predicting that John would be champion, and he even gave his blessing for Bones to replace him and fight for the title when he got injured. And even said if John won, he was going to change weight classes. Fighters have a very small window of opportunity, and this kid's just letting the window close. Did you and offer? now it's in this situation where, well, this guy's my friend, and that guy's my friend. Dude, you have way too many friends. <laughs> the situation was getting rocky, and the media were honing in on it. Be John Jones' friend for life and never fight him or never talk to him again and beat his ass in the cage, which would you choose? You know, I would rather beat his ass, to be honest. <laughs> Immediately after John became champion, Evans declared he was leaving Team Jackson. Eventually, they were booked against each other and apparently ran into each other into a club in Vegas where John said, I think things are going too far, but I want to be the first to tell you that I am going to destroy you. Evans had had enough, felt betrayed by the Jackson team, was tired of the two-faced behavior, and that's when you got this famous clip. Your fabric is fake. My fabric is You're fake. fake. Tell me how my favorite shot. When it did come down to the fight, however, it ended up being a dominant showing by John, who proved he truly just was the better fighter. And I think Evans had seen the whole scenario play out in his head several years before. Number three, Habib Namagamadoff and Conor McGregor. I have never seen a rivalry that got as heated and intense as what Connor and Habib built theirs up to be. But what if I told you that years before that, these two were on great terms? In fact, they were, you know, pretty much friends. There was a time where, where you and Connor were pretty cordial with each other, almost friendly. Fanboy! The man was a fanboy. He bought t shirts of mine. And Connor's not lying here either. There are tweets of Habib looking to buy one of his t shirts. The cracks first began to show as Connor started mentioning his aspirations to move up to lightweight. Much about it, Khabib. 
my buddy Khabib. Yeah. There are no friends in this game. <laughs> business, business has no friends. And unfortunately, for two guys as competitive and both as talented as this in a hostile world of MMA, I mean, their friendship just was never going to survive. Well, I like Conor McGregor, but he come on 55 for minutes smashing. His trash talk is no bad. He know how how make money. If he come 155, welcome. Once Conor had a title, he was moving up to lightweight, which put him on a collision course with Habib. And with him being the bigger star, he even stole the title fight from right underneath him. This is number one bullshit. I think all Irish fans understand who deserve this. Connor come to lightweight and he talk about oh I'm greatest but you guys know beginning of the year he tapped like chicken. And over the next few years things devolved pretty quickly. You have Habib slapping Connor's teammate Artem that led to Connor attacking the bus and then all of the back and forth animosity that led to the most heated press conference of all time. I don't drink. Why don't you drink? I'll tell you some booze are parties. I never knew. You're mad backwards. No. Yeah, I dead when I get me hands on you, do you hear me? But you actually fight like a little shitty jokes rat anyway. You're a little fake belt over there, you be a guy, a real estate agent. You're a phony, a fake. The fight was a complete scrap, and Habib fought angry and can even be spitting on Connor after he forced him to tap. Connor talked trash before the fight, but during it said it was just business. For Habib, he didn't talk much up until the fight because it was never business. It was 100% personal. Number two, Chuck Liddell versus Tito Ortiz. Now this one, you could say, is all Dana White's fault. I mean, he managed both these fighters before Zufa even bought the company and together in the gym, that's where the rivalry first started. Those guys worked out together and Chuck beat him in the room every day. Tito became the face of the UFC. He won the light heavyweight belt, but Chuck was slowly becoming the people's champion because he was KOing everybody. He was a bigger character. The company pushed him, but they kept him away from Chuck. Tito was very happy with that. Tito knew I cannot beat Chuck. At first, I think Liddell was okay with it, but eventually realized he was never going to get his shot while Tito was still in the way. Chuck never said anything. Chuck was his friend. Those workouts that all meant something to Chuck. And eventually enough time went by and Chuck goes, man, I got a window too, and I deserve to get whatever I am good enough to get. And that includes the world championship. Instead, he became almost undeniable as a contender. And so Ortiz publicly agreed to fight. Him. Sorry to say it, but Chuck making good loss. I mean, no bad blood or anything, but at the same time, it's strictly business. But Tito would backtrack almost immediately. I don't know. I'm not really thinking about that right now. Me and Chuck, I mean, our friendship's not worth the money we're getting paid, if you ask me. Fans were pissed, but Randy Couture literally spanked him instead. Only then did Tito agree to settle the score with Chuck. There was nowhere left to run, and the training room stories all seemed like they had all been true, as Liddell went on to knock out Tito in the second round. I mean, their rivalry didn't stop there, and in fact, it never really went away. They'd run it back a second time, did a whole season of The Ultimate Fighter, and of course, a rematch 16 years later, which most definitely should not have happened. Okay, of course, we've got to make some time for some honorable mentions in this list. When Woodley fought Robbie Lawler for the title, they had been trading partners and, I guess, friends at ATT, but they were not enemies when they clashed for the belt. When Nick Diaz fought BJ Penn, they had been friends in the past, and, you know, Nick was very upset that the UFC were making him fight his mate. Andre Arlovsky has fought Alistair Overeem, who he was enemies with after training together and saying he was a bad sparring partner, and he also had to fight another training partner and friend, Travis Brown, who had stayed on his couch. Roy Nelson fought Big Foot Silver. They had trained together. They were friends, but not enemies. Donald Cerrone trains at Jackson's gym, so he's fought a few teammates. First, he fought Melvin Gallard. They turned enemies. And then he left the gym and fought Mike Perry. They kind of had a feud over it. Mike had been training there at the time. You also have Bisping fighting Matt Hamill. You know, they weren't friends, just teammates on The Ultimate Fighter, but definitely rivals. Evan Dunham agreed to fight Tyson Griffin, his training partner. So did Nick Lentz when he fought Will Brooks. And so did Pat Barry when he fought Anthony Hardong. The point is, training partners might fight each other fairly often, but they don't always become enemies. But then we get to number one, Colby Covington versus Jorge Masvidal. This makes me sad. You guys were boys. You spoke so highly of him in that interview. I don't know if you remember. If you would sell out our friendship like that so quick, we never had a friendship. At the time, their friendship had started because it was just a perfect matchup. At 23, Colby left NCAA college and was recruited by American Top Team. Jorge was already there with over 30 pro fights, and they both had a lot to learn from each other. They were training together, living together, motherfucking playing co-op Call of Duty together. Me and this individual shared a lot of memories. 
memories, you know? Yeah, um, you guys were real friends. Tra- tra- at some point, I would have considered us real friends. And all this just fell apart. Well, seemingly not over nothing, but something that probably could have been resolved. Ripped off my coach. Didn't didn't pay him money. My coach was training him since he's an amateur all the way till he got his title with RDA, and then after that, just ripped him off. Both got kicked out of ATT because they were beefing over it. When I'm training in the pro class, you disrupt the, the gym and the pros. He'd be screaming across the gym. He wouldn't come to my face. Yelling across the gym because he's got coaches holding him back. So, of course, Lambert had to step in because he's disrupting the pro training climb. He's disrupting the whole gym. So he had to step in. He kicked us both out. Now, maybe that could have been resolved. Maybe Colby was looking to just flip to a heel and cause some chaos. But what's sad is I don't think I've ever seen two UFC fighters be closer. To get his own copy of the key to the house. I mean, they basically cornered each other for nearly every fight. But I suppose it made for the ultimate grudge match. Literally best friends turned enemies. They had the chance to settle it all in the cage, but the fight was kind of lackluster. But Colby came out on top and it wasn't that close. But that also wasn't enough for Jorge, who allegedly went after him outside the octagon. And now I think it's elevated to Scarface levels of vendetta. Ooh, well, there you go. Brother versus brother. Ten times the two lads just couldn't handle their shit anymore and had to have a scrap. I could have filled this with Anakin and Obi-Wan references, but you're lucky I didn't, all right? Shout out to Luke Taylor. Check him out at call to me underscore. He edited this video, guys. You know him by now. You can catch him on the podcast, and you can also catch his new YouTube channel as well, which he's done with his mate. Lots of fun stuff. We love you. Yeah, it's me, Bailey and Steel, here to shout out the Hall of Famers. Thank you each and every single one of you. It really means a lot of your membership. Cheers. Let me know down below what you thought of this one, okay? It's sad stories. Friends turn in rivals, you know? It's kind of the nature of the game in some ways. Uh, maybe it's expected, I don't know. You let me know your opinion down below. I always like to hear them, especially on something like this for this one. But anyway, I've been Bailey and thank you very much for watching, okay? And go not beat up your rival or start shit with your mate. Go make peace. Have a beer with your best friend. Go do that.